History, any history buffs? Anybody? Okay. History shows us that sometimes people admire the determination, uh, the tenacity of someone more than if that person is correct, more than if that person is right. Even if that person is deceived, if he sticks with it, if he sticks with his plan, no matter what, they admire him and overlook his offenses. It's the effort that counts, they might say. Or it's the heart behind it, they might say. Consider, for example, Hiru Onoda. Hiru Onoda. Onoda was trained by the Japanese army in some very specific things, notably guerrilla warfare, sabotage, counterintelligence, and propaganda. Don't those sound like great things? Anybody want to sign up? That's what they trained him for specifically. Guerrilla warfare, sabotage, counterintelligence, and to go along with that counterintelligence, of course, propaganda. Think about those words. He, so after his training was complete, he was sent to the Philippine island of Lubang in December of 1944. At that place, he was, he was sent there to specifically foul, frustrate, and slow the advancement of Filipino and American troops who were fighting to free the Filipino people. Slow them down. Do whatever it takes. That was his training to do all of that. 29 years after the Japanese army surrendered to the Allies aboard the USS Missouri on September 5th, 1945, Onoda walked out of the jungle and surrendered. 29 years after the war had ended. For 29 years, he fought when there was no fight. During those years, Onoda attacked hapless and defenseless farmers and their families, murdering them. He burned their homes and fields, he found the, their community silos and burned those. He attacked and murdered uniformed authority of all kinds. The list is long. He ignored countless attempts to convince him that the war had ended. Peace had come. He disregarded contact by civilians as well as thousands of leaflets Many times that, that were dropped, telling him that the war was over, peace had come, please come home. He ignored them all. Finally, in 1974, he reluctantly surrendered to his superior officer, who had been searched for and finally found and then flown to Lebanon to convince him that it was over and that he was to surrender. Onoda was still wearing his tattered official uniform. He had his original rifle, his original sword kept in excellent condition and slung about his shoulders, as well as his army-issued dagger in its original white case. Intensely loyal, he was still using the weapons and tools first given to him, even though they were outdated and terribly unnecessary. When he was returned to Japan, you'll see a picture above me of his return on a, a jetliner, many gave him a hero's welcome. They marveled at his ten tenacious faithfulness, but others, although quietly, criticized him for being deluded and a decades-long murderer of innocents. Soon after his return, Onoda became angry and disillusioned with the truth he learned and found in Japan. People were prospering. People were at peace and enjoying it. He didn't like that. He didn't like these people with their guards down. It wasn't good, he thought. He didn't like it that no one trained and used the original tools and weapons he revered so much. He couldn't accept the truth, as well as the changes it brought, so he fought against it by calling vocally for a more committed and warlike Japan. Eventually, Hiru Onoda rejected and left Japan, 
and died in 2014. Here's the question. How would you have responded to Hiru Onoda's return? Warmly or harshly? Was he a hero or was he a threat? I give you this today because we Christians sometimes struggle with an uncomfortable conundrum. On the one hand, we have a favorite passage, John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Read this with me, would you? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Meaning, of course, the world needed saving. It needed life because it only had death. This is the God we love. We love this one. However, the God we love also says some very harsh things, specifically in the Gospels. But if we're not prepared to accept his vantage point, what he knows, what he thinks, which is the truth, I think you'd probably agree, then we will be very unsettled by the Jesus we find in the Gospels. So our series, Snapshots, looks at some of the uncomfortable things Jesus said and did. And we choose God's vantage point for us, which is after the cross, after the resurrection, and after the beginning of the new covenant in which we have been given all things for free by faith because of Jesus and his earning them and giving them to us. We love those truths. We love those gifts from him. So you'll understand then if Jesus, in setting up people to believe in his crucifixion and in his resurrection and to receive salvation and life, you'll understand if he comes strongly against teachers of the law and the Pharisees who are insisting upon clinging to the tools they've originally been given and using them as weapons against the truth, against God, who was oftentimes standing right in front of them. They are deceived, and they're using Old Covenant Scripture, uh, a covenant which is about to be surpassed by the one that is about to be introduced, and they're teaching against forgiveness of sin. They're teaching against God, against new life, against the new creation, against the authenticity of Jesus, the Messiah. So, while we'll get to our, our, our passage and parables in a few moments, I want to first cite Matthew chapter 23. Maybe, maybe it's something you read all the time, but it's the most angry Jesus we find in the Gospels. Why is he angry? Because those who had been entrusted with the care of God's word as well as the care of the people for whom it was given so that they may hear it, see it, read it, and know God, those people were refusing to believe that the Messiah was right in front of them and that he had come to bring the very thing they had been taught. And they were instead clinging to old tools, unreliable now, wrong now, and they were harming and burdening believers in God. Seven times in Matthew chapter 23, just to sum it up, Jesus commands three words right at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who said this must be fulfilled by all y'all. Seven times he uses three quaint, gentle little words. Here they are. Woe to you. Woe to you. In other words, I'm telling you that trouble and affliction, those two things, trouble and affliction are coming your way. They're coming for you. Woe to you, he says to them. He pronounced these things publicly. Why would he do that? Because he wanted everybody to get the picture. They're against you. I am not, neither is God. 
and made it very clear. He didn't introduce nice little conversation starters, you know, some kind of a vocal lubricant that we could all get along and just be friends. He didn't do it. Not at all. Woe to you. Such a nice thing to say. So let's start not in a parable, but in something that precedes a parable. In Matthew chapter 21, we'll begin reading at verse 23, and then we'll get to our our, uh, two parables today. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts. By the way, what happens there? That's more or less that day's church. This is where the The great teachers and the students of the truth would come and discourse and debate. And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. Here they come. And they asked him this, by what authority are you doing this, these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question, just one If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Verse 21. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, "Um, If we say from heaven, he'll ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, ah, we're afraid of people because they all, they all believe, they hold that Jesus, or rather John, was a prophet. So what are they doing? Are they friends of the truth? No. They're managing things. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> uh, suddenly, these people who had opinions as long as you've ever known... I I don't know. A clueless. And so Jesus answers, okay, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. That's not very nice. The God I would prefer would would have convinced them somehow. He would have done something. He would have been nice. Here, have a Slurpee. Have a meal. Let's, let's get together and do, do something by which I can convince you. But he's been telling this to them over and over and over again. And they've been resisting and rejecting him. This is not on the screen, but in John chapter 5... Jesus speaks to, you guessed it, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and says this in verse 37, and the father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, that's that's pretty harsh, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And what did he, how did he identify himself? I am the way, the truth, and the him. Not words about him. He who is the word imparts life to those who believe. In other words, Jesus has had this argument many times before. Okay. Let's look at our first parable, the parable of the tenants, the parable of the tenants. Jesus is once again speaking to the Pharisees and teachers of the law, those who had already decided that Jesus was of Satan and needed to be killed. This parable uh, uniquely is a trap. It's all about proving their intentions, which was to kill the Savior, and he wanted to to be proven right in front of people. They're against you. I am for you. So people would know. Verse 33, we'll begin there. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Now, who is Jesus talking about? What landowner? God has a long history of talking about himself as a landowner, as well as a vineyard about his people. A lot of analogies, but this is also from Isaiah chapter 5. We won't go there, but I'll describe some of it to you. And there, God identifies himself as the landowner, and Israel, believing Israel, 
as the vineyard. Isaiah prophesies that while God will do everything he can for a good vineyard, believing Israel, the tenants, those responsible, the teachers of God's word, and the caregivers of the vineyard produce nothing of value, sour and worthless grapes instead of sweet and valuable. And God says in Isaiah chapter 5 that he will bring a captivity upon the vineyard, He'll give it to someone else because of the bad managers or tenants. By the way, give give attention to how good this landowner is. Picking it up in verse 33. He will put a wall around it. He dug a wine press in it, and he built a watchtower. Why would you build a watchtower? Because you're watching for enemies that would come in and steal the crop or poison the the vines, do something bad to you. He's done everything for this vineyard and for the the tenants. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers, and he moved to another place. Verse 34, when the harvest time approached, and by the way, that could have been four or five years after a vineyard is planted. It would have taken a while. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants, and by the way, these are likely the prophets, Uh, who are those who check up on how things are going. He he sent his uh, servants to the tenants to collect his fruit, verse 35. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. These are rather high crimes. This is not going very well, verse 36. And then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. This, in other words, this rejection of God's messengers has been going on for a long time. Verse 37, last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. And Jesus, of course, has formally identified himself as the son of God, the heir, leaving no doubt as to the identity of the son in this passage, in this parable. Verse 38, but when the tenants saw the son... They said to each other, oh, opportunity. This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. And so they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And in my mind, Jesus has set the trap. Here we go. Verse 40. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He asks, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Verse 41, they pipe up. Suddenly they have an opinion. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Isn't that a good double use of the word? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. I imagine there was probably a brilliant, if short, brief pause while he looked at them. (laughs) Just a little one, but I bet it was powerful. And then he said to them in verse 22, have you never read the scriptures? Who's he talking to? The scripture readers, them, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, the chief priests. Have you never read the scriptures? And then he quotes from Psalm 118, with which they would have been very familiar, probably memorized it. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. The answer was that, of course, they were familiar with this. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Please understand that this parable is not about the church. It is not about the body of Jesus Christ. Some have used this passage to insist we'd better get busy producing fruit, and they've used it to minister guilt and fear and to apply pressure. But God is taking the kingdom away from the control of teachers like that. He's ending that. It doesn't fit with the new covenant where God will live in us, and nothing will separate us. And there's no pressure, only faith growing in believing 
who he is, where he is, and who we are as a result. God will produce the fruit in believers such as you. The fruit that God loves is people believing the truth preached, written, and ministered to them by the Holy Spirit and by the apostles. Consider them the most unlikely people in the world to give the word of God and the care of people. Don't you think? But these are the same upon whom or or to whom the spirit of truth was given. And you're that now too. The spirit of truth has also been given to all who believe. But these leaders were resisting and rejecting what was coming because they were insisting upon their own self-righteousness tenaciously. They valued it beyond all things, but God hated it, and he was crushing it to pieces. That's enough of that. No more. Verse 44, anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 8. In other words, this is ending. Nothing will remain of this system. It is over. One way or another, it's ending. This abuse, this lordship by a few burden-loving, burden-giving people, leaders, is done. The prophet Joel says it this way in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. In our passage, those days were almost upon them. And today, those days have arrived. On all who believe, the Spirit is given. Verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. So they repented and apologized. Oh, no, they did not. (laughs) Nope. Verse 46, they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Luke tells us that the first thing they did was left, but not to go away and reconsider, but to conspire a new way to get him and to kill him. Let's look now at the parable of the wedding banquet. Now remember, before we read this, to whom is Jesus speaking? Who is he looking at? The teachers of the law, the chief priests, and the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Now, what's the picture here? Father God is providing everything. He's providing the party. By the way, this word party is mega party. This is celebration where all is given. Come and have the time of your life. And he's provided all the food, everything, for the Son of God who has come for his bride. Believers, who as, as, as Romans chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Philippians chapter 2 have it, they are to be spiritually united with God, which means the most, truth, the most true thing there is. That's what's going to happen. There's going to be a union, not just ceremonially, but truly a union of God and believers. He's going to come and live in them and be united to them. And that's a wedding on a grand scale, one that the Father is offering to all who will believe and receive even today. Verse 3, he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come on in. But what do they do? Nope, not gonna. Verse 4, then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who've been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. In other words, I've spared no expense. I'm all in on this. Y'all come. Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, ill-treated them. It's another way of saying abused them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, 
The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. In other words, they rejected the feast, they rejected the groom, they rejected the Son of God and made themselves not deserving. They wouldn't have it. So go to the street corners and invite the bank, to the banquet anybody you find. Does that sound familiar? All. Everybody. Verse 10, so the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find. The bad, as well as the good, behavior didn't seem to matter. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed something. He noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, verse 12, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. This is an interesting term, speechless. It's no small thing. It means he was made speechless. It, didn't, it, did, it doesn't mean that he kept his yammer shut. It meant that he, he was made speechless. He was caught. He was exposed by the question because he was not wearing the wedding clothes on purpose. Furthermore, it was the tradition of the Jews that when a king or the groom invited you to the wedding, he provided the wedding garments. This doesn't mean all of your clothing. Uh, please divest yourselves of your clothing, go into this little room, put this... That's not what it means. It means these rare and costly garments that revealed your status, favored by the father, favored by the groom. You had been qualified. You'd been favored. Please accept this so that you may have an identity in here. Favored. That's what had been rejected by this man. This guy was the ultimate wedding crasher. And Jesus is telling the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, if you think, if you're thinking of crashing the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Son, the heir, whom you have rejected and are working so that others will reject him, you will not succeed. You'll not make it. In the book of Acts, it's not on the screen, but Peter, who had just been responsible for healing a crippled man in the name of Jesus, has been arrested by the Jewish leaders, the same we've been talking about, and put in jail. He's then brought before Jesus, uh, rather, he's then, he's then brought before the highest of the Jewish leaders, and here's what happens, an echo of Jesus' words in our passage. Acts chapter 4, verse 8 says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's a good thing, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, they were put, they were, wait a minute, you can't do that now, that's not right, you're doing the wrong thing. Verse 10, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Verse 11, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone upon this. I'll build my church, Jesus. Verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must, we must be saved. John chapter 10 um, verse 8 says this, All who have come before me, Jesus says, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. I am the way. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out, and they'll find pasture. In other words, they must be saved like this. They'll find pasture if they come through me. Everybody else is false and offers something less, something else. 
Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what he's doing. That's what he's offering to us even today. And how does Jesus conclude the parable in Matthew 22? This is a really warm fuzzy. You're going to like this. Verse 13, then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. In other words, you can't get in because you've already rejected me. The implication is that the one so bound will be weeping and experiencing his own gnashing of teeth. That's how it is for those who work against the kingdom he was introducing, against the truth, against what you and I have to the full in Christ Jesus. And he's telling them, woe to you, knock it off. I've come for my church. I've come to give everything to, the, to people who believe, all of it. I'm going to hold nothing back. They'll have it all. So stop what you're doing because there's something much better to be had. So in this, he always separates who he's talking with as to what he will do one day. We must as well. We've got to be careful when we look at the parables to ask the question, what has not yet happened, the cross and the resurrection, so that people could believe and receive all that God earned and gave in the new covenant, what has not happened, and to whom is he speaking? And it's to the Jews, and specifically, particularly to the leaders, the chief priests, the Pharisees, and those who were teaching the people, you must earn this. You must fulfill the law. And he was saying to them, stop it. Woe to you if you keep teaching this. Woe to you. And to us, the church, hallelujah. He was taking the kingdom away from leaders who would abuse them and had been for centuries. He was taking it away from people who would say, I'm watching you. I'm keeping you to account. I'm going to hold you accountable for what you do. Rather than the account that would be stuffed full by God's righteousness for you and given to you by faith. What do you lack in Christ? Not a trick question. It's all been given. All of it. He's withheld none of it. But even today, If Pharisees, chief priests, dressed up as others, can induce you to think you may have lost some of the all that's been given, that it's been dirtied, sullied, corrupted, and you've got to fix it, then they can get you to go right back under the thumb of those who would abuse. Don't put up with it. Stand up in faith in Christ. Amen? Amen.